Hey Lobo fans, this is Eddie Nunez, Director of Athletics, and you're here watching Talking Grammar, episode 67. Hey, what's up everybody? It's Jeff Grammar with the Albuquerque Journal, and this is the Talking Grammar podcast, episode 67 now. As you heard, it's Eddie Nunez, the Athletic Director of the UNM Athletic Department. We go over kind of a wide variety of topics with Eddie in this conversation. I I uh, probably don't hit him with the follow-ups or get as in-depth in some of these as maybe some of you fans around the Albuquerque and the UNM community want. Um, future episodes will kind of go one topic and dive in a little deeper. This is more of a wide-ranging um, conversation I have with him, but we do cover a lot of ground. We, we hit a lot of topics about the job he took over six years ago at UNM. We talk about Lobo football. We do talk about the future of Lobo football and the importance of getting it right for the UNM Athletic Department. So cover a lot of ground with Eddie Nunez. I hope you enjoy this conversation with him. And I hope you enjoy all these conversations that we're having on the Talking Grammar podcast, also the Midweek Blitz, which is a high school football podcast we have here as part of the Albuquerque Journal Podcast Network. You can catch all of this at abqjournal.com. And I hope you enjoy. Hey, what's going on? It's Jeff Grammer with the Albuquerque Journal, and we are here with Eddie Nunez. Eddie, thank you for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. I'm glad you uh, got to get to see the new studio here. It's the first time you've seen this, right? This is. This is really nice. I, I mean, Coach and Mash said it was a, you guys are doing it right here. This is this is legit. I well, like it. You, you brought up Coach and Mash, and, and Jamal Baker was here as well. Yep. Um, I I guess I, I'd be remiss if I didn't ask why you, uh, I, I will offer if you want to wear your sunglasses. You think I should? You could wear them like Mashburn did during uh, during the interview. I mean, we can do it. I mean, if everybody <laughs> thinks everybody likes it, we can sport them. But no, that's not me. I, I, did, I did tell him I was going to do it. It, but uh, no, <laughs> I'll um, leave that for him. Sunglasses optional on yeah. uh, on this podcast. So, um, as you said, you were the athletic director at UNM, um, hired in 2017 from LSU, and uh, we're gonna. I'm, I'm gonna preface this interview a little bit here with. Um, we're gonna go over a lot of stuff and uh, kind of, you know, not get in depth probably as much as some people might want us to on some of this stuff. But uh, you know, I'll, I'll have you certainly on future shows. Hopefully, we can kind of go more topic specific down the road. Absolutely. Um, what I'm going to do here, though, is uh, I do want to start while you have been here six years now already. I don't know if it seems like that longer, seems like longer some days probably. But uh, while you've been here a long time, most people know you. I do want to kind of go over a little bit of your background first. And uh, what got you here? You uh, Let's start with uh, Miami. Yeah. Is that, you're from Miami and you, you played some basketball there, right? I did. I did. Born and raised in Miami, Florida. My, uh, both my parents, of course, Cuban, um, came over to um, when I was from Miami, again, born and raised, played basketball, Miami senior. Uh, some legendary coaches from Shaky Rodriguez. There was a couple other assistant coaches at the time there by Anthony Grant, um, the name Anthony Grant, Frank uh, Martin. Both of them have not just been successful college coaches, but are extreme you know, mentors to me. Mm -hmm. um, started there, had an opportunity to go to the University of Florida, play there with under coach Billy Donovan. And from my time there, I thought I was going to be a coach. You yeah. know, he really wanted me to be a basketball coach and, and follow his line. And I did it, enjoyed it for a little time. I uh, had an opportunity to be a GA there. We we had success, went to the Sweet 16 national. And then the following year, the national championship lost to Michigan State in 2000. Um, from there, went to Marquette University, was there for a little while and had some opportunities to go to other schools. But there was this itch that I still had uh, wanting to to look at the administrative side. Jeremy Foley, one of the, the ADs at, or the AD, excuse me, at the University of Florida, and a mentor to, to me, basically pulled me aside. And um, we had a long conversation years before I got into coaching. And when this time came about again, he offered me an opportunity to, to, to take a chance at Vanderbilt, actually. And he said, Interesting. Eddie, this, there's something open there. Why don't you go take a look and see if it works? And Spent, spent three years at Vanderbilt, never looked back into the coaching world, administrative-wise. Spent three years there. From there, went to LSU. Spent 14 years at LSU, really in all different facets while I was there. And uh, this opportunity came calling. There was, a, there was a bunch that were being presented those years yeah. leading up to this one. Um, I was really trying to find a school that really had, was a flagship institution, had an opportunity to be successful in every sport. I want uh, again. Why do we go to a place that we can't compete for championships? And I right. wanted to be at a place that I knew we can do so. Um, and this one really offered a lot to me. And when I when I was asked to to participate in the search, I, I you know I did my research, started looking into it, and saw too many things that I really liked: the culture of the community, the 
the, the fan base, the passion that it brought was had a very similar, uh, uh, I guess, feel to what LSU gave me when I was there. So um, the more and more I looked in it, I had uh, it was it, it kind of set up perfectly yeah. for myself to come after it. So I I want to touch on one thing um, in that past before we yeah. before we move on to the UNM part of it, and that's you, you mentioned Frank Martin. He's now at UMass. Um, I know I just hired. Uh, I, I think last year or in the past year he hired uh, Alan Edwards as associate head coach. Yep. I'm curious. Did you get to see any of them when you were there just this past week uh, for the football game? <laughs> the crazy part is that I didn't get to see them. They're both recruiting. Uh, he's also hired Brett Nelson, who was a uh, basketball player at the University of Florida when I was GAing. So there was uh, and Alan's brother Doug, who was a McDonald's All American, actually the number two ranked player behind Kenny Anderson when he came out in 1989. Um, played in the NBA, very talented. All of them were there. So I did get to see some, didn't get to see others. Um, but no, Alan's there. He's having a great time. They've got a really good team looking up, looking into this year. So, uh, but I did catch up with Frank at several other meetings, and uh, I had to do a speaking engagement here recently that he was at as well. And you were obviously, I mean, you're playing at Florida. Uh, you were a pretty good player yourself. Maybe not as good as Oof. Alan Edwards. Oof, enough. I don't even know if they're in the same category, but keep going. But you, uh, well, you you <laughs> did get involved um, at in your LSU yeah. days, from what I hear, in some uh, pickup basketball games. No, that, not that. I'd have been an All-American style there. No, my previous, uh, my actual playing career, um, I was a stereotypical, look, just put me in, do, let me do what I got to do. Yeah. I'll, I'll rebound for you. I'll... I'll slash, I'll defend. Um, so I really wasn't the guy who's going to score 20, 40 you know, points a game. It was, look, I know my role. I wanted to be a part of championship programs. I, d- I made this decision years ago. And if you look back at all the teams that I, was a part- that I participated in, in high school, we didn't just win multiple state championships. We also were nationally ranked in the top 10. Okay. Then you go to college, and yes, it's, floor- it's Billy Donovan's first couple years. Um, it's kind of starting the whole process. But I knew what he brought to the table because he was at Kentucky. And then I knew what he was trying to build. Then we go there. So for me, it's all about playing, uh, being associated with championships and championship programs and coaches that can help us get there. But when you ask the question about my time at LSU, um, there was some pretty good basketball there. It was called the the NBA, the Knicks. It, we, we took out the S, but it's the Nick Saban Basketball Association. He kind of ran lunchtime noon ball. That's what I've heard. And, and I've never actually talked to you about this. And, and obviously that's not the main topic I'm going to talk to you about here. But uh, from what I hear, some of those pickup games, like Nick Saban runs a – like he, he's, he's one of the – he goes out there and he plays to win. Oh, it's he it's, doesn't just coach to win. He's playing to win in a pickup basketball game, isn't he? Everything he does is is all out. He wants to win. He wants to win big. And so, a, a quick story, as much as I can make it quick. When I first got there, he was already pl- he was there. It was two thousand three, and some of the other coaches I got to know real well. Some of the assistant coaches. Then he had Derek Dooley, Kirby Smart. I mean, you, you go, uh, uh, gosh, months must champ. The who's, who's of the who? Fish, Jimbo. Jimbo Fisher. You had the who's of the who. That were there that now not just legendary head coaches or coaches at Division One or you know been at some point, so they asked me to come play. I said you know what, sure. So I get there and I'm, they pick their teams and yeah, coach picks the teams. He picks himself <laughs> on the team. Everybody else goes around it, and so he wins the first game. Team comes out. I think I'm going in. Uh, no, he he actually said nope. This is the five that are going to be playing. So here I am, totally my thumb on the side, thinking. Well, why did I come if he's not going to pick me? This next game I go, he he loses, but he still stays on. He picks his team, so he didn't care who's on the other team. So I was actually because he picked somebody from the winning team to be on his team. I get to go on and play. Well, we run, we win that game, and he gets upset, reshuffles his own team, still stays on the court. We win again, That's awesome. and at that point, third game, he all of a sudden looks and says, "All right, stop." Stops the game midway. Reshuffles all the team. He, I'm on his team from that point on. I never, uh, I never, I was never off his team. So we won a lot of games. <laughs> well, so that that's the uh, yeah. that, that's probably the uh, the feather in the basketball playing career cap. If if Nick Saban made sure you were always on his team, yeah, that might be the one. He he, he tried to stack them pretty good. I will say that. <laughs> um, he, he still tends to do that. He's a good recruiter, I guess. Right? He is. He is. So, uh, you get to uh, you get to the University of New Mexico um, from LSU in 2017. Um, I certainly know what the what the landscape that you entered the UNM landscape was what that you entered into and I'm curious in hindsight um, how much of it was 
what you were told it was. Um, I know there are some aspects that you could never know when you take a job. And uh, did it ever get to the point, you know, in the past six years where it was like, well, man, had they told me this, I would have never came. Did it ever get to that point? Um, I guess I'll start off by saying when I first took this opportunity, I knew that there were business challenges. There were financial yeah. challenges because that some of that had come out in the media. Yep. And had just hired Paul Weir because they had gone through that transition. So I knew a couple things. New basketball coach, football program, had had gone to a bowl game. Um, I knew that they had some business challenges, financial challenges within the department. Um, but it, it didn't come to light until the day of my press conference. So did the press conference. And right after that, it says on the agenda, meet with President Chucky Adala yeah. at the time. And he says, and it's at the president's house. I knew he wasn't living there. It was used for other purposes because he was still the interim. Interim, I guess, yeah. And so I went and met with him, and I sit, we're sitting there in his in the kitchen area, and he just starts rolling it out. He's like, um, well, you know, besides this, let me explain to you some of the other things that you're facing, and you have to understand. And it was, there's a couple investigations going on in your program. You've got, you're under the DOJ watch. Your, uh, your financial issues, you know what they are. You've got some some inquiries from the attorney general. You have seven, basically seven audits or six or seven audits at a time. You had uh, attorney general, the state auditor, the internal auditors, and I'm just sitting there thinking to myself, did I sign the contract? I mean, <laughs> Is it already signed? so lo long story short, I it, it hit me hard. Um, and then shortly after that, I was told I had to cut sports. So it was a lot, and I would uh, and I'd be lying if I didn't say my first year. I really sat there a couple times saying, why did I do this? Yeah. Why did I come to a place, especially when you have mentors like Jeremy Foley and others that are telling you, Eddie, we've been at ADs for 20 plus years. And what you're experiencing, they've never experienced in their 20s, yeah. that collective. And so it was hard. Um, I'm a person who always bets on myself and says, look, if that's what you're, you're, you're challenging me with, I got to try to see if, I could, if, if we can make it right. And once the process started, for me, it was all about, I've got to make this place better than I than I received it, and so um, I never looked back at that point. Yes, there was a, there was a second time, once or twice that I, you think about, oh, this is this is this is not pleasant right now. Yeah, you want to come here to help teams get better, and you feel like all you're doing is just fixing things internally that nobody can ever see. But you know what it had to be done, and so um, yes, a lot a lot uh, a lot of scary uh, things were thrown at me that first day. But as I look back today, it's made us better. It's made us stronger. Um, and now it's, it, we look back and how much we've overcome. I, I scare future ADs yeah. when I go to all these conventions and they ask me to speak. And I, I tell them, do you want to know what it is to be a first-time AD? And I kind of list it on, the, on the, every, <laughs> everything that I, that I was given that first year. And, say, and everybody looks at it and says, this, does, this didn't happen throughout many years. This happened your first year. Now you still yeah. want to be an AD because you're going to have to address this. And it kind of opens up a lot of people's eyes and you know what? It, this is the reality. This is the, the, the career that we've chosen to do. And so we got to do it right. And we owe it to our student athletes. We owe it to our fans. And so. Well, I'm glad to hear that if you came into that realization on your the day of the press conference, it wasn't because of the press conference. No. It wasn't the the, the media <laughs> no. scrutiny that no. uh, you walked into. No, you, you kidding me? If you go back and look at the pictures, they gave me a, a red coat <laughs> that remember. went to my, my elbow. And I was like, what, what am I doing here? So yeah. I literally didn't even want to move my arms when I was speaking. Yeah. So, so it was good. But you did get the uh, the cherry blazer. You had, I did. You had the cherry blazer. So I did. Um, since you've been here, uh, the 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 black cloud, if if uh, that's how one might describe it, over the athletic department, um, it, it hung for a while, and, and it was still a lot sure. of scrutiny for several years. Um, I'm going to kind of you can comment on any one of these, but these are some of the the big, at least visible um, speaking visibly speaking, uh, kind of bullet points that I think people know have happened uh, on your watch so far. There's been some coaching changes. You went from Bob Davey to Danny Gonzalez. You, you went from Paul Weir to Richard Patino. Obviously, a lot of other coaching changes happened mm -hmm. um, in that time, too. Those are the two high-profile ones, obviously. Um, Lobo Club restructuring, uh, that, that's actually a pretty big one, too, that at least people involved in the Lobo Club may, may be aware of, but that was, uh, that was a big part of, yep. of what you, you've done since you've been here. You mentioned the cutting of sports. You were you were basically told, "Hey, come take this new AD job and uh, cut two very successful programs." Absolutely. And uh, soccer and skiing were cut. Uh, you made a move on media rights that uh, maybe wasn't as visible to the everyday person, but um, pretty big, 
business decision in the college athletics world yeah. um, to, to shift from what was Learfield to right now, remind me the name. Playfly. Now, Playfly. And um, you also, I think that was my whole list here. Uh, there, there's definitely a lot more. But, yes, those were the. Well, so, let so, me yeah. mention one more, COVID. You, um, yeah. Navigating the athletic department through COVID, um, talk about unprecedented from all your mentors. Nobody's ever gone through COVID, first of all, right. through the whole country. But the state of New Mexico ended up being the only one um, because of a health order and because of restrictions that did not play a single game, a single Division I game, or was not allowed to play a single Division I game uh, in its home state. And you guys yeah. did that with football and obviously basketball played entirely out of state. Women's basketball was allowed with no fans to come back for one game, right. only one game. And uh, both of them lived in hotels throughout the year, and the football team lived in mm -hmm. a hotel uh, throughout the season. You navigated all that, and for that you did, you were recognized by the Mountain West Conference, only the third person um, to be recognized by the Mountain West Conference with the Commissioner's Award. And uh, that was for the navigation of this athletic department through through yeah. that COVID season. So that's a whole lot. And um, now that's not just in that first year, but a lot of that was in your first year. Yeah, I would tell you that... Um Changing culture, and we'll talk about this, and I know everybody says changing culture or tries to, to talk about what that really means. And for me, it was setting a standard that's different than where we, are, we were. And it started with looking at ourselves internally. One of the things was the Lobo Club. The way it was structured, the way it was working wasn't really operating at the level it needed to be. When you look at everything else, um, there were issues with the department and transparency. You know it. We've yep. talked about it from IPRAs and everything else. And for me, it was, look, we have nothing to hide. We want to put ourselves, we want to be transparent. We want to make sure that people know that who we are, what you see is what you get. And we're going to carry ourselves with high values, high integrity, high character, every one of us, the whole department. I'm going to hold everyone accountable just like they're going to hold me accountable. And so as we went through every step of those um, from, again, the budget challenges, fis the, the fiscal watch, um, trying to generate revenue, trying to build trust with our fans, um, for me, one of the things that was probably more eye-opening than anything else was learning that the trust wasn't hard to gather from our fan base. They just wanted to know that we were being honest with them. Yeah. And again, it's, it's a simple process. Yes, we understand it, but it, it's being who you are. And, and who I was was somebody who I knew we had a lot of things. I brought in great people around me to help me with a lot of these areas. I've got an unbelievable staff. And then when you talk about our coaches, yeah, some of them were were – changes that needed to be made. Um, and then there's coaches that, you know, this past year, a month before the season starts, and you're dealing with two of your most, not just longest tenured coaches, but your most Successful. accomplished coaches. Yeah. And they're both making decisions that they feel were the best in this time for their lives. So making a change is, for coaches, it's about finding the right fit. And we've done a great job. I mean, honestly, and again, it's not just me. It's our staff. It's everybody helping me do that. Um, and those two coaches, real quick, for anybody yeah. that, that may not um, follow UNM athletics beyond maybe the, the marquee sports, that's it's Joe Franklin, of course, national yeah. champion. Two um, national championships. Two yep. national championship cross country and uh, track and field coach. Mm -hmm. And uh, Glenn Milliken, um, I can't remember how many years, but men's oh, yeah. golf. 20-some um, years. 20-some yeah. 20 years and, and obviously a lot of success there. Yeah, and, and again, those to find individuals that can not just – we weren't trying to replace them. What we're trying to do is find somebody that can complement everybody else that we have here and continue to strive for success. I want championships. I want to be able to do it, but we're going to do it the right way. So, you know, the, when you talk coaching change, you talk global club, you know, we had to do things that needed to be done. Then you start talking about, okay, now i got to cut sports. And one of the things that, that brought that, that, that decision or that recommendation that came out was we weren't doing things right when it came to Title IX. Right. We were way off base. And so having to assess our program and realizing how far away we are from where we needed to be was part of the decision that went into making those recommendations. You know, to, till this day, and we've, done, we've had some real serious issues that we've had to face, that's one of the hardest things I've ever had to do, is sit and stand in front of those young men and young women and say that we're having to cut their sports. Um, I, I, you know, again, I would have loved to have them here longer, but... Ideally, we just couldn't do it budget-wise, Title IX-wise. and But we're, we're making strides, and we're doing things that we need to do. We bettered since all the six years we've been here, we balance our budget. And I know people say, well, you know, some of those years you, you, you got a little help from the campus. Absolutely. Yep. And we're with that help, we're still extremely lower than 
everybody in the Mountain West when it comes to institutional or state support. So even with just those little helps, we've been able to balance it, financially manage it the right way. We have a great support system from the campus. The president has been unbelievable. President Stokes has been one of those that not just says she wants to support athletics, she's there. She's cheering mm -hmm. us on. She's helping us understand that this is a crazy landscape that we live in. So um, I look at all that, the, 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 the financial things that we brought in from new ticketing from Pac yeah. Allen, um, new parking, new um, the multimedia rights, all that has helped us generate more revenue, which is exactly what we hoped it would do. Um, we're in the process of different other other ones as we speak. We've uh, we've signed we re-signed our Nike contract, which the last time we signed it, Nike was pulling out of all the group of five schools. There's probably a handful that have actual Nike contracts, you and know. we're one of them. Yeah. And we just are in the process of renewing again for another four years. And that shows everyone that we're doing it right, and we're representing Nike, one of the biggest products out there, and our teams love it. And our, so all that is is part of this process. Um, but, you know, again, I could talk for days on all this because I'm proud of the successes. As much as there were challenges, I'm also proud of where we are today because of them. I want to put a pin and get back to or revisit one of the things you commented on, and, and it has to do with the the budgets. And, and yeah. it's something I've covered a, a ton of. Um, former colleague Jessica Dyer and I would sit through all these regents <laughs> meetings. I remember. Um, and as you guys were cutting sports and doing all the finances, and, and this was an athletic department that didn't make budget, you know, whatever the number was, eight out of 11 years or yeah. something like that, and kept finishing in the red, sometimes not significantly so, sometimes, you know, six figures. Yeah. Um, so it was getting a lot of scrutiny there for a while, and some people did point out that in the early years, uh, even of your tenure, mm -hmm. you, it would make you would make budget, but only with a you know late fiscal year gift from the regents or from the president's right. office or some some transfer of money kind of gift. What I will point out though, and and you kind of put in in uh, you kind of mention, is those that financial or that institutional support mm -hmm. still never got you. To what what the the median um, oh, kind no. of level of institutional <laughs> support around the Mountain West Conference is, so people do expect yeah. the UNM Lobos. Um, certainly in basketball, they expect championships and they expect you guys to compete in every sport at a certain level. You guys are not getting the state or institutional support that your peers in within your own conference are getting. Is that accurate? Hundred percent. I mean, we're 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 still ninth out of eleven, and even with all the changes and the increases that we've made. Everybody else is also growing. Yeah. And so our state has been great in supporting us. Our institution has done what they can because it's it's been hard. Um, we've generated some more revenue with basketball and some, and, and we're we're going in the right direction. What the challenges that that I think many people forget is the those those transfers at the end of the year for those first couple of years were partly because we made a we made an arrangement in some respects with the president and with the financial offices. Look, if we do what we got to do, yeah. we manage our budget. We we make the the sacrifices in certain areas. We held we held about thirty positions one year, yeah. and part of it was showing them, look, we're not going to overspend just to overspend. We're going to do this right. And so we get to that point, and they're looking, and saying they've done it right. They've done it better than they were. They said they were going to do. So let's help them where we can. Yeah. And that and that's that's. It, it, I've always said we want to be able to show them that we can do it and do it right. And I've said that to every state official that I've ever sat down with, legislator, every governor. What, give us a chance to show you that we are going to do this and re, and represent the state the way it needs to. Um, and if we do it, then help us where we can. And mo, and many have have. And I do appreciate them tremendously. I mean, we fight every year. I mean, we go up there. It's not a fight. It's it's we work with them. Yeah, we truly do. We work with with our legislature. A lot of with people our, would describe it as a fight. Well, it, going to Santa Fe every legislative <laughs> session. I've spent more. I, I think I spend <laughs> three quarters of, of the legislative session up there. But it's part of it is just being there to answer questions. And if I'm there answering questions for the university or any other component that I can help with, I'm willing to do it. It's, yes, I'm there for athletics, and but if they see me, then I'm there to help. If there's a question about the health, health system, I might not have an answer, but I bet you I could find out where somebody that can. Yeah. And that's what they appreciate. Some of the uh, ways you can, you know, kind of bridge that gap between you guys being ninth out of 11 in the Mountain West um, in terms of institutional and state support is uh, the self-generated funds yep. that you guys have to kind of come up with every year. Um, 
I do want to to ask you about fundraising. Fundraising is something that has gone up tremendously. Um, almost hit $10 million last year from the Lobo Club. Um, yeah. And when I say almost hit $10 million, <laughs> that sounds like good news to a whole lot of people. But when I mentioned it to you, uh, when I did a story yeah. a couple months ago, you uh, you were quick to point out that your goal was $10 million. It was. It was. I, I've, I've, I keep reminding them every day. So they came with this year's goal, which I'll, I'll hold it for their own <laughs> behalf. Mine is also a little higher than that. So since I've arrived here, there's always been a golf course for fundraising and different areas of fundraising from the gala to the golf tournament. I strive for more every day. I do. Yeah. I tell our people, look, every day we got to get better somehow, some way. And what is that standard? And so um, to, to, to be a little short from 10 million, I get it. I was pushing myself a little bit more than out, but I knew we can get there. And it, I knew it wasn't hard for us to get there. You know, we, nine and nine, almost nine and a half million is, um, it's pretty dang good when you it's look at it. It's never been done here. No, it's never been. And, it's at the level that it's been. It was done. If you think you take back, coming out of COVID, coming out of all the coaching changes, coming out of all the stuff we've done, it gives everybody a chance to really look and say, you know, we we're doing some pretty good things through some challenging times, um, which could set us up really great for the future. It really can. Some of the other fundraising um, efforts that you guys have had. Uh, you mentioned the, the gala, the the mm-hmm. Lobo Club, and all that. How much of that picked up? With men's basketball, and 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 I say that to also then kind of spin forward. How important is men's basketball to this athletic department? Uh, I would say, first and I'm going to get to the other sports too yeah, in a minute. But I, men's I, basketball, I, I would say it is extremely important. And if and if it's not just dollars, I, I think people sometimes correlate with the importance with money. The importance is also the 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 that attitude, the feeling around the city, the feeling around the state that we're being successful. And it's a pride. It's about that pride. It's about the the, the, the relationships that, that come about it. To see the pit with all the suites sold for some for these big games and already going into this upcoming year, we're, we have basically every suite sold. Yeah. When I first got here, I didn't know if that was going to be possible. Looking at previous history and seeing everything, and I sit here today and saying, What's more important than the financial, which is great, and I need it, we all need it, the institution needs it, is watching our fan base up there interacting, seeing businesses taking advantage of the suite, seeing businesses taking advantage of the events so they can generate good hospitality for their own customers, for their own business, and that's part of this. It's an economic driver. The, the, the men's basketball here, even women's basketball and football, and we'll talk about all those, but the pit when it comes to men's basketball, the economic development portion of what they bring to the city, the state, is it's huge. And and that's that to me is what's why it makes it one of the most impactful sports that we have. It isn't again just dollars and cents. It's about what it does for everybody else around here. Dollars and cents part of it. You mentioned the suites being um, almost sold out, uh, did really well last year, obviously, yep. as the basketball team had a really good season. Um to, to be clear, you guys don't keep that money, though. You don't keep the no. sweet money, right? That's no. still going back to pay for a renovation. <laughs> That's going back to pay the wonderful debt that uh, of the facility when it was renovated. So um, I will point out that, that, look, a deal's a deal, and if the deal said you guys had to pay it back, yep. that's, that's the deal. Yep. Not a whole lot of universities, though, are making their athletic department pay for facility upgrades. Facility upgrades usually fall under the university's kind of um, yep. umbrella. Um, not everywhere, but you guys... Um, you got athletics is, is paying for it. They don't make uh, necessarily the biology department pay for a new biology building. The right. university covers that. But uh, in this case at, at UNM, um, UNM is covering the uh, UNM athletics yeah. is covering the cost of the athletics building renovation of 2009-10 season. Fans will remember that season when they did still play in the pit, but um, there were some open doors uh, um, in the concourse and stuff yeah. like that. So the sweet money goes to that. And, yes, and, and will for how much longer? Oh, well, we have uh, 19 more years of the of the debt. So And it's because it's been refinanced prior to my arrival. Yeah. We've done it once or twice since I've gotten here to lower those payments. Um, but, yeah, we still have a couple more years to go. Okay. Yeah. Um, now, the the lower bowl, and there's still some mm-hmm. seating up, up top, too, that is uh, is your guys'. Um, three and a half million is what you guys made in, in men's basketball ticket revenue last yep. year. Um, obviously, it's not all about dollars and cents, no. but uh, but it helps. And not only did the ticket revenue help, but um, in, in other aspects, as you mentioned, not just the, the attitude and the kind of the – 
the sense of community. I know I came from a one high school town, and, and on Fridays when we played you know high school football game, businesses would put their even black yeah. and gold for Alamogordo High School. They'd put their black and gold uh, flags out in front of their business and stuff like that. You know, I gotta gotta shout out Alamogordo High School every now and then. Um, to get that sense of community in a larger city, it's tough to do sometimes, but it's something you guys are trying to do. You guys are trying the the Cherry Fridays. You guys are trying yeah. to get more businesses to to wear school colors and do stuff like that. That doesn't happen six years ago when when you're coming into a situation with a little bit of a black cloud over the, no. the department and, and a question of trust. So I, I will say there's more of that going on, and uh, but that takes some time. It does. I hey, I was those first couple of years, and even still today, there's times I drive around and if I see somebody out there wearing something, I, I tell a story. It was my second year, and I was driving my daughters to school, and on the way from school to to work, um, it was a gentleman. It might have been 7:30 in the morning, cutting his grass, and he was wearing uh, a Lobo shirt, mm. and I just pulled over, gave him a hat, and a couple of shirts, and I and to me, it was a way of starting to spread that message. We knew that we had still things that we had to address within the department. But more than anything else, it was starting that process, gaining back to trust. And look, we, we have a lot of competing, uh, competing uh, entities from the isotopes, the, the United um, High Schools. So there's a lot of things happening for us to be able to continue to, to build our brand and to build that, that, that spirit, that community spirit. Part of it can, goes back to even COVID. If you think about COVID, when we couldn't do a lot of things, one of the things we want to do is be leaders in our community. And we rallied around many of our, our donors and our sponsors and our um, many just great uh, just friends that gave us things that we can donate back to our community from food to medical equipment and everything else. Whatever we can find, we were doing what we can. That helped us get to where we are today. And so I, I, I to for us to continue to, to to strengthen that brand across the state requires us to do it right. It requires to us to be committed to the community. It, it, we have to do our business right. But then lastly, we have to win. No, again, yeah. they want to be associated with a winning program. And so we've done a great job three years ago or two years ago now. Um, I don't like to talk too much history, but, I, but two years ago, we had six conference championships more than any other group of five school. That's a testament, again, to our team stepping up. That was during COVID. That's yeah. one of the reasons. So um, proud of it. But we got we got some more work to do. Some of the challenges currently facing not just you guys, but every college athletic department in the country is uh, NIL and still navigating through that. Locally, the 505 Sports Venture Foundation um, is is uh, kind of tackling. They're the collective um, uh, here in Albuquerque trying to help you guys navigate right. that. NIL, um, name, image, and likeness, for those that don't know, this is how athletes now can get compensated a little bit while they are college athletes. And it is a, a slippery slope for an athletic director. Um, yeah. You guys still have to follow rules that are constantly being adjusted and, and rewritten over the last couple of years. And I, I would say that from, from my seat over here watching the NIL world develop and where you're at, I, I would say you seem to be a reluctant or at least a cautiously optimistic or cautious participant yeah. in the NIL world. Um, where do you stand right now with NIL and 505 Sports Venture, um, specifically here in Albuquerque? Well, I'll say, first of all, I'm not reluctant on our student athletes making, generating revenue for their name, image, and likeness. That to me, look, as a former student athlete, I think that's awesome. Um, if, if they can do that, you know, you saw um, Luke White song, you've seen some others between Sadie's and other companies here sure. locally that have decided we wanted to partner up where I was a little reluctant, a little reluctant, but it wasn't because of the individuals running it or the organization of the, was the collective. Because for me, my concern is still because we're not hundred percent fully funded in all the sports. Right. And that is a priority. You know, our, our teams are still fundraising to help their overall budgets. So now we've made strides since I got here. I mean, I think we're maybe at 50% most sports, we're closer to 70 now. We still got to get all the way to 100. So for my my hesitancy from the beginning was more so because I didn't know how it was going to affect our fundraising. And were we going to be able to both live in the same space, yeah. understanding we all want to get to the same goal. We all want to be successful. We all want to give our student athletes uh, an opportunity to, to generate the revenue that they they, they can. Um, but we I was trying to figure out how do I get there and still get the Lobo Club where it needs to be. Yeah. So we, what I did really last year was I was supportive of it, 
I give Kurt Roth and the 505 Sports Adventure a lot of credit for coming and sitting down with our compliance office, sitting down with Dave Williams, my deputy, and really just having dialogue and understanding, look, what, what are some of the things you want us to be careful with? How do you want us to? Because, yes, they could have gone out of the gates and said, we're going to do this. And they did. They yeah. were ahead of many in our league. But for me, it was like I, I, tr I always trusted the individuals that were part of this group. But as individuals, but doing what we're trying to do now, everybody was trying to understand, how, what does this mean? What does yeah. the collective mean? What are the guidelines? What are the parameters? So where we are today is I sit back here and say, okay, we just finished this past fiscal year. We've fundraised more than 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 um, Had ever been, than yeah. ever been done. And again, testament to our Lobo fans and supporters. And we were able to do what we needed to do for the, for the for the collective group. They did what they needed to do. We keep an arm's length away from them because that's what the NCAA wants us to do. Yeah. It makes it challenging because at times we cannot communicate as well as we probably need to or should. Um, but we're working with them as much as we can to to make sure that this path forward is the right path. So yeah, I'm supportive of them. I, I think it's we need them now more than ever, just like we need the Lobo Club and, and our fans to continue to support the Lobo Club and our department because we have to be successful. I still need charters or I still need travel or I yeah. still need nutrition for our teams. What they're doing is helping our student athletes so we can get some some opportunities to give them a chance in this NIL space. So um, much more supportive, I guess <laughs> I would say publicly now than I was before because I was very cautious. Yeah. Uh, and it wasn't that I, again, I was just cautious. I wanted to see if we can get to where we needed to be. And so we still got some more to go. Yeah. Now, I, I've got to continue to raise money for our department. That's a, that's a must. And they have to continue to raise money for, for the collective because, and, and one of the things, again, that Kurt and his, his group has done a great job of, it's not just basketball, what people kind of mis misunderstand. There's football, there's women's basketball, there's, there's softball, there's, there's track, there's yeah. golf. There's, so when you have every sport getting involved, the more we can provide to our student athletes in every way we can is going to be a key. To be very clear, you, anybody reluctant to, uh, to contribute to this collective um, at this point, if, if they want to support Lobo Athletics, mm -hmm. you and UNM, as, best, as much as an athletic department can, or giving it the uh, the stamp of approval, you can yeah, go forward I, with that. My, my stamp is it, it has a little fine line, fine uh, details <laughs> in the bottom that basically says, um, if I, if you're asking me, I'm going to say, continue to do what you do for us, and make sure that what you do for them is above and beyond. Above and beyond. Because until we get to 100% fully funded budgets, right. I I can't fully 100% say go. You know. So and and again, I, a testament goes back to them. They're great people. Our donors, they understand it. Um, they ask before. They'll be the first ones to say, "Do you are you okay with us yeah, doing right. it?" And so we work with them. All right, I'm going to move to football now. Uh -oh. um, I know this is what a, a lot of people in this community, especially the Lobo uh, athletics community, um, are paying attention to right now. I know basketball did start this week as we record this. Mm -hmm. um, they started practices, but their season is still a, a month away. So. Football's going on right now. I, I'm curious, football's place in the college athletics landscape right now, I think everybody understands is so important. How vital uh, for the UNM Athletics Department and um, just really any athletic department in general, but how vital is it for UNM to get football right? Well, I, again, if, if you're interested in college athletics in any way, you, you've seen what's been happening across the country with all the conference realignment. And if you think about conference realignment and understanding how – it's all going down and why decisions are being made and why schools are going cross country and everything else. Yes, it's associated with financially what they can generate for their institution by going to a different conference. But what it's also showing is that football is a driving force in this. And it's because the money that's coming from this is coming from the TV. And so when, when people ask what is, why is it so important for football to be successful? Because we have to continue to put ourselves, our institution in a position where we're in that conversation. The, the last thing we need to do is we can't just depend on basketball or our other sports that have been unbelievable, our Olympic sports, the, the softballs, the soccers, the cross country, the tracks, the, the, the golfs of the world, tennises, and it goes on and on. They've all been great. But what's right now holding us back is really three things. It's our investment in our football program. It's our investment in our football stadium. And it's success. And, and look, I'm not saying something that, that Danny doesn't know or anybody yeah. else. 
it's we have to be successful in football and we have to be able to invest in the right areas when it comes to our program. And we got to invest in our stadium. You know, I think one of the things that people saw this, past, you know, a couple weeks ago within the New Mexico State game is, look, first of all, we dropped the ball when it came to uh, getting people in and out of the facility the way they should have. Mm. And we're doing our due diligence. I own it. We, we thought we had a, a plan that was going to work. Some, we didn't have some staffing didn't show. Things didn't work out. But it also showed us that our venue isn't conducive to do everything that needs to be done nowadays. Getting 27 plus yeah. thousand fans in. And then and the other thing is I want to make it desirable for our fans when they get inside that the restrooms, the concessions, the, 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 the overall experience, the fan experience is what it needs to be. So when we talk about fan, uh, in, uh, basically reinvesting into the stadium, yeah. it isn't going and putting foo-foo walls and pretty stuff. And No, no. It's about doing the right things that are going to help make it better for our fans. The fan experience. The yeah. fan experience. And that's all it's about. We're going to have some ADA stuff that we're going to have to improve. There's some, there's some, everything that revolves around the stadium should be about our fans. And that's what really um, that investment needs to be. The other part of it is uh, winning on the field, obviously. Yeah. Um, and the, the big question right now is while Danny Gonzalez, the, the football coach, is, is the, the popular choice a few years ago as the local guy, not just a, a former UNM player, but from Albuquerque. Um, the, the wins haven't come yet. Sure. I'm curious how how you assess um, going into this is his fourth year. So how you assess his job? I, su- I suppose security the the is the seat hot under Danny Gonzalez right now. The coaching seat. How uh, how you address the questions about Danny Gonzalez's future with Lobo football? Yeah, well, I, I think it, you know, and I think many of those that know um, the way I, the way I do business when it comes to our coaches is really assessing their whole their whole time here, but also the whole year. Yeah. So you know when people say or, or when people ask is the seat hot underneath Danny? The reality is that's, that's the outside perspective. When it comes to Danny, when it comes to myself, when it comes to our department, nothing's changed. We are moving forward together hand in hand to make this right. Uh, we want to win every game that we compete against. We want to make it the best experience for our student athletes. We want to have our, our coaches getting the most out of it. So there's no hot seat when it comes to me. For, for me, it's evaluating every aspect of the game. He does an unbelievable job in the community. You got to also take in again where we were when he first got here. First year he is first year is COVID, so he's being asked to move to Vegas for 43 straight days, and we made some strides. Starts building a team, the way he learned how to do it, which is four year guys learning how to do it. Well, the landscape changes. Now you got transfers. Now you got guys jumping left and right, for for good reasons. He had to kind of reassess himself pivot he may he said he'll sit here today and say look probably had to make some changes within his coaching staff should maybe maybe should have happened earlier maybe should have at other points so as I look at everything I try to assess how he has gone about making decisions how he's how he is recruiting the right caliber individuals um, how he manages his program from top to bottom and at the end of the day yeah I'm going to sit down with him just like we did last year and I sat down and I was very critical with him just like I want him to be very honest with me and I'm going to tell him, look, these are things that I see. These, and tell me where I'm wrong, and if where do I need to help you? Mm-hmm. Because for me, it's not just about what, how can we grow the program incrementally. That's that, that has to happen. But what I really want to know is how are we going to get from here to here? This is a championship. How do we get from here to here, and what do we need to do? Because that's where I really need to put focus on. All this other stuff. If he's doing it the right way, like he should, we should achieve that. So I, I'm hope, you know, again, I'm hopeful that we continue to. To, we had a great win this past weekend against uh, Massachusetts. Um, it's 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 a different approach to way to coaching that it is today. Um, I, again, I love where the program is. We still needed to win more. I'm not going to sit here and say no. I'm not content. I am not. Um, he's not content. I'm not content with with the amount of wins that we've had. Um, but there are also other factors that have led to that, and that's what sometimes it's hard for people to see when they just look at a, a, a stat line and says, well. Three and whatever, yeah. or they've only won two games. Well, what what transpired there to get to that? We'll ask you about the guarantee. Yeah, does him guaranteeing a bowl game in any way <laughs> play into that post uh, season evaluation process? Uh, no, that's that's him. You know, from my perspective, you know, I, I want to be in a bowl game every year, and that hasn't changed. So if that's what he views that he needs to do, that's on him. For me, yeah, we I want to be in a bowl game every year, and. If we, again, if we don't make it, why didn't we make it? 
if if things didn't go our way here or there, well, you got to take that into account. Uh, there's there's too many different factors today to just base it just off wins and losses, and especially at a pro- program like ours. Um, we need somebody who's committed to the community. We need somebody who's committed to making this program better every way he can. Um, and and I, I know Danny is doing that. I know he is. But his uh, his statement to to be in a bowl game, that's on him. That's He made that decision, and uh, I support it because I believe it, and I've believed it since day one. I'll wrap this up with this question. Um, conference realignment's the big topic of the past month, at least, couple months of college athletics and the Mountain West is, is yeah. in a unique position in, in all of that. What does UNM need to do? What can you tell us about realignment in general, first of all? Anything you can tell us about the Mountain West and Pac-12, <laughs> but also does what does UNM need to do to position itself as best it can to uh, not entirely be left out? I know it's not getting to a power yeah. conference, certainly not this cycle, mm-hmm. but what does the the does UNM need to do to make sure it's positioned to, uh, to kind of survive this current wave right. of realignment? I think you, if you go back to the last couple of years, last three or four years, the, the the current TV contract that we're in shows a lot of people that we were doing things differently. Everybody was going out there signing 10-year contracts with their TV rights. We did a 5-1. Why? Because we wanted to be, we wanted to put ourselves in a better position after several years of, of kind of reinvesting, putting more of a focus on the sports that we needed to put a focus on. Um, the last three years, our programs have done a great job as a whole. If you look at our football programs, we've competed, been in the top portion, out the top group of five program. American has got us one year here or there, but the fact is we have been consistently in that one or two in the group of five. The Mountain West. The Mountain yeah, West, yeah. exactly. And so when you look at the Mountain West as a whole, currently where we are, when you realignment, we didn't have anybody jump ship. Yeah, there was talks of other schools here, there. That, that's great. But the fact is, the first go around that came around, we stayed strong. Second one, we're still here, and and that's a, that's a testament to our commitment as a as a conference. Sure, people will say, well, you didn't have a chance to go here, or somebody didn't have a chance to go there. You're probably right, but there's a lot of conferences that are in the group of five that had a lot of change. Yeah, and we stayed strong together. So. That's that's a huge emphasis for everybody out there to say we're, we have a chance to be the best FBS conference in the West, and we can carry that flag. What happens with Oregon State, Washington State? Honestly, that's that's between our president, our commissioner. I know they're having great conversations with both of them. Um, I know those ads extremely well. Love to have them, you know, be a part of the Mountain West if that's what it, it works out to be, or whatever some combination. Yeah, yeah, whatever, whatever combination. The name may be. Um, I do believe they would fit uh, our team, our, our group, and only elevate us even further um, to be not just the top group of five, but right underneath those other four. So we have a shot. We have a shot to, to make it um, really special here. And it's, but part of it is they've got to figure out what they got to do. They've got some legal battles going on right now between the the the, the PAC conference yeah. um, and the the former members. So it's going to take some time. And it's part of my, you know, again, it's part of my role as AD. But also being on the Division One Council and some of these other things is just watching how this landscape changes and making sure that I can do everything I can to put UNM Athletics and this institution in a position where we're, we're, we're in that conversation, that we're not just part of it, we're in it. And we're in it for the right reasons. So, yeah. I, I didn't answer anything for realignment because yeah. I don't see I don't have many many answers. Um, I Nobody think everybody has to. great great thoughts, but um, that's that's kind of my view. Eddie, I appreciate you doing this. Um, I appreciate you going through as much as you did uh, with all of this with UNM and just sort of your background too. Um, I do hope to have you on future episodes, maybe more topic specific, yeah. and we'll dive into a little deeper some of the specific topics on this um, football. Football is the future um, for at least the immediate yeah. future uh, for college athletics, and and I know you're hoping uh, hoping for a big finish, almost at the midway point. I guess starting conference yeah. play right now, yeah. but um, uh, I know you're hoping for good things with Lobo football. Um, can I get a guarantee of an NCAA tournament out of you for the men's basketball team? Absolutely not. Absolutely uh, no guarantee. No, I don't. I don't. I don't make. I don't make postseason predictions. Right. Uh, I've I've learned a long time ago. It's. Um, uh, 
I support our coaches and I, I want them to all get there, but it's up to them to make it happen with our student athletes. But uh, I'm excited. I know you said football. I am. I'm excited about football, but I'm also excited about all the other sports. I mean, volleyball right now is kicking butt. You know, soccer is as well. We've got our golf teams. Our, go our men's golf team just won the tournament. Yep. Um, a lot of great things happening. And the one thing that I keep echoing, and you've heard me say it time and time and time again, I just want our, our fans out there to come support these student athletes. Don't worry about the dollars. Don't worry about everything else. I know everybody wants to think about all the negative. Go support these kids because they need you. They need you now more than ever to show. To, they want to see that Lobo passion of what makes UNM Athletics, what makes Albuquerque, what makes New Mexico such a special place. Appreciate it, Eddie. Thanks for coming. My pleasure. Thank you. All right. Well, hope you enjoyed that conversation we just had with Eddie Nunez, the athletic director of the UNM Athletic Department. It's uh, a lot of topics, obviously, to, to cover, a lot of ground to cover with Eddie there about UNM athletics and college athletics in general and kind of what's going on in the college athletics landscape right now. Hope you enjoyed it. Hope you enjoy all these conversations we're having on these podcasts, on the Talking Grammar podcast specifically, but also the Midweek Blitz, which is our high school football podcast that we have coming out every week. Um, that comes out on Wednesdays. And uh, all of these are part of a digital movement by the Albuquerque Journal where we're expanding more, certainly a lot more than just a news a newspaper and a, and a print product, um, but we're getting into the podcasting world. We're getting into more digital. We're getting into more visual videos. So hope you're enjoying all this. You can give me feedback at any time at ggrammar at abqjournal.com is my email. You can get me on X, formerly known as Twitter, at Jeff Grammar, and uh, give me future show ideas. Give me some questions for some guests. Let me know what you think about these podcasts. Hope you're enjoying all of them. And uh, you can always subscribe to the Albuquerque Journal. Support local journalism. Help shows like this helps our print product, helps all the stuff we're doing at the Albuquerque Journal. That's abqjournal.com slash subscribe. And that's how you can uh, help us out and support local journalism a little bit. And again, help shows like this uh, continue to, to come, be produced, be uh, brought to you wherever you get your podcast and here on YouTube as well. So hope you enjoyed Talking Grammar podcast this week and uh, hope to see you again next week. Get, get.